would recommend a grab and go box for some of those things. I mean, obviously some papers, you know, birth certificates, merit, marriage certificates, car titles, these, those kinds of things, you know, you may have stored in a safe deposit box at the bank, a safe at home. If you have a portable document file that's fireproof, that's waterproof, that's something that you can take with you if you need to evacuate, that would be a good place for copies of a lot of the documents. For your passport, I keep a notebook that's got a lot of information in it. A copy of that is in my grab-and-go box. So saving them in a place that's going to be safe, that is also easily accessible, would be a good idea, I think. As students, we practiced what to do in the event of a fire or a tornado. The goal was to learn what to do in an emergency. As adults, we know how to protect ourselves when a tornado warning is issued or what to do if a fire occurs. However, we may not know the steps we can take to protect our family and business finances from unexpected events. On today's Sound Living, preparing financially for unexpected events. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. Just one flood, fire, or tornado can wipe out a lifetime of savings. On March 9th, as part of the Living Well Wednesday webinar series, K-State Research and Extension Family and Consumer Sciences agent in the Central Kansas District, Deb Wood, and the Family and Consumer Sciences agent in the South Wind Extension District, Joy Miller, will be discussing how to prepare your finances for times of disaster. Deb and Joy, you're going to be presenting a Living Well Wednesday series on preparing your finances for times of disaster. That's in early March and really just in time for kind of our tornado season because we're really talking here about things that we need to plan for that are unexpected natural events. Yeah, natural events. I mean, and and in Kansas, we've got tornadoes, we've got flooding. Most recently, we've had wildfires. It can be a health event. You know, there are a lot of different things that can be unexpected, but it's best to have things prepared or things ready in advance so that they're easy to grab. And just tagging on to Deb's statement, you know, we think of a natural disaster and those seem, could seem far and removed or once in a lifetime, but really everything we're talking about is just as Deb said, an unexpected one-time event from a car repair, medical event to maybe just even a fire. So everything we talk about is pertinent from the disaster to even estate planning and settling somebody's estate. So the information is valuable no matter what you're trying to prepare for financially. Yeah, I think sometimes we associate with finance as just money, and there is a lot more things that are financial than just money. There's the physical aspect of money, but then there's all the things you've invested in your whole life within your household that you forget or don't consider if you have to replace all of that content. Insurance is going to be really important when it comes to recovery after a disaster. You want to make sure that you're adequately insured. You want to protect those investments. You know, all of those things in your household that Joy was talking about and your home itself. And even after you've paid off the mortgage, you know, obviously when you've got a mortgage, you probably are required to have insurance. But afterwards, you want to make sure that you continue that. You want to make sure that you take a look at that every year and make sure that it's updated, that you are adequately protected, or at least that you're making a conscious decision if you decide not to insure something. But for most people, their homes are their, you know, a big part of their net worth, and you want to protect that. I guess along that same line, too, we have the household inventory, and we probably have a lot more things than we realize. And how do we go about inventorying all of that stuff that we have? There are apps that you can keep track of that on. There are, you know, forms that you can fill out. One thing that I've done in the past is go around and take pictures. You know, even to the point of opening drawers and closet doors and stuff, you know, to take pictures of. So those are some ways to do it. You're going to want to keep track of what the item is, kind of an idea of when you purchased it, how much you paid for it. And so Deb mentioned taking pictures. You can also do videos. You know, with our cell phones, we have the ability to go ahead and video things. And then we can come back and do a voiceover and talk about what's in them, you know, when you made purchase it, what you paid for it. Having adequate insurance is, is one thing, but you won't be able to utilize 
the benefit of that insurance if you don't have good documentation of what's in your home. And when you go to make those claims, not only are they going to say, oh, I had a 60-inch TV, they're going to want to know the model or the serial number and what you paid for it. And when you're under stress, I can't even recall it right now, let alone if I was under an emergency scenario. So it just makes that recovery faster and easier. Also having that inventory and knowing what you might have paid for things can tell you if you're adequately insured or not before the disaster happens. Do we also need to think about maybe replacement costs too? Absolutely. And it depends on the type of insurance you have, whether you have actual cash value or replacement costs. I'll give a personal example. You know, we farm and so the equipment, the trucks and so forth are scheduled. And so, you know, with those, you're going to get paid out what the value of them would have been. So depreciated costs. But a home itself, if you have actual replacement value, you will get paid out what it would cost to replace that item rather than what it might have cost you to purchase that item or build that item in the case of a home. So that's something to consider. And with cell phones, Joy mentioned cell phones, that's a great way to take the pictures because normally those pictures are stored in the cloud. And I was going to just mention, if you're doing the video recording with that voiceover and so forth, don't just keep whatever it's recorded on. Make sure that you've got that saved in more than one place, whether you put a copy in a safe deposit box or you have that in the cloud so that you can access it. Because if something happens to that video camera or that flash drive or whatever you have it saved on, then you've lost those records. What should you do with some of those other important papers? I would recommend a grab-and-go box for some of those things. I mean, obviously, some papers, you know, birth certificates, merit, marriage certificates, car titles, these, those kinds of things, you know, you may have stored in a safe deposit box at the bank, a safe at home. If you have a portable document file that's fireproof, that's waterproof, that's something that you can take with you if you need to evacuate, that would be a good place for copies of a lot of the documents. For your passport, I keep a notebook that's got a lot of information in it. A copy of that is in my grab-and-go box. So saving them in a place that's going to be safe, that is also easily accessible, would be a good idea, I think. And some of the things in my grab-and-go is having a copy of things that can identify who you are. We have a copy of our driver's license, our passport, social security, birth certificate, marriage license, things that can identify us. And then also we took a picture with our cat so that it helps identify if for some reason we have to prove that it is our cat. My next section in my book is just my current account, utilities. I do a lot of things online, but can I get into that account or can somebody else help me get into that account to whether I need to shut off utilities, cancel subscriptions so I can stop some of the financial leaks that might be happening where I need to conserve my money versus continuing to spend it. So there are things that can help you get back on your feet or you can address your financial business after a disaster. So as we've mentioned, the household inventory, your insurance policy, your contacts. Deb, what else do you have in yours? The document that I put together has, you know, like our financial provider, the banks, the bank account numbers, copies of credit cards. Joy mentioned, you know, your your bills, your utilities and so forth. There are a lot of things anymore that I get an email that tells me a bill is available online to go pay. And so, you know, those kinds of things. How do I receive the bill? How is it paid? That sort of thing that I keep in my notebook. And, and that's useful for family members if something happens to you personally, you know, even outside of that disaster. Another thing that I keep, you know, passwords. If something happens and you have absolutely nothing left, how do you access those accounts? You know, you need to, if that's something that you've stored on your laptop that you no longer have, or that you've got written on a piece of paper by the computer at home or whatever, you know, if you've lost all of that, how do you access those accounts? So passwords are another thing that I've added to that important information, those documents that I keep. The last thing I would add is copies of your medical cards. And if it's important to know what medications you're taking, it's amazing how many people aren't for sure what medications they're taking and what's the dosage. And so having that medical 
copy of your your insurance card, your prescription card, and who your physician providers are, and then you know your prescriptions can be helpful if you have to seek out medical care. And if you have durable powers of attorney or financial powers of attorney, wills, that sort of thing, those two should be kept in there. And another thing that I keep in in our box is some cash so that we have cash. If something happens, you've got some cash to spend. Because if you're in a tornado that takes out a whole town, the bank may not be able to function. They may not be open. There may not be power, you know, that sort of thing to where you can easily go get that. They may not be able to run credit cards. I know that's not something that I carry on me much at all anymore, but I do keep some at home just in case we have an emergency. What about maybe after a disaster? Are there some things that we can do that might help us out down the road in terms of maybe documenting the disaster itself? So that's important, too, in your grab-and-go kit is to put, like, a notepad and some pens and pencils because... The ability to retain and know what people have said or what you've done, it'll be hard to keep that all in your your memory. So writing down everything, who you talk to, what day, even just documenting at this time, this is what happened. Like if it was a tornado that went through, you know, you can write down what damage you saw. But physically documenting will be helpful as you have to go back through records or, or know who you talk to. After an event like that, yeah, you're you're going to be traumatized. You're going to be going through grief. I would say, you know, have a friend go around and take pictures of things afterwards so that you have a record of what things look like immediately following. I, you know, after, if you've had some damage, you need to try to protect what's, you know, like if windows are busted, try to put tarps over them to keep rain from coming in, that sort of thing. But wait until you've contacted the insurance company before you start making any kind of repairs to anything. They need to come out. They need to inspect. You need to get that claim filed. But, yeah, there's just a lot of things. You know, I, one, one thing that we learned, if you're still one of those people who has a landline that is now gone, it's blown away with the wind, and you're wanting, you know, your first instinct is to call and shut off all the utilities. Why are we paying for you know, internet and TV and trash service and phone service of things that are not there any longer. But if you're wanting to port that number and keep that phone number, do that before you call to cancel the phone service. Because we learned the hard way that you no longer own it. And so you can't port it after you've cut off the service. Well, there's a lot to cover and you're going to cover all of this in detail on your upcoming webinar. Maybe a little bit about the webinar series itself. This is really just meant to help people with all sorts of activities that kind of fall within the family and consumer sciences area. Right. Ours is on March 9th, and both of the topics in March do have something to do with finances, but there's also, you know, nutrition topics, mental health topics, just a lot of things that have to do with the family. The real goal here is to prepare before something happens because we just don't know with Mother Nature what might happen down the road. Right. You have no idea what the future holds. And all the preparation can save you hours of recovery. So, again, I take it back to just even the daily life. If you know where your Social Security card and your birth certificate and you know where it's all located, you can alleviate stress in your day-to-day to the point of if a disaster happens to you. And Joy brings up a good point because that's something that it can help to relieve stress to help your finances on a day-to-day basis, not just in the times of disaster. That's K-State Research and Extension Family and Consumer Sciences agent for the Central Kansas District, Deb Wood, and the Family and Consumer Sciences agent in the Southwind Extension District, Joy Miller. To register for the March 9th webinar on preparing your finances for times of disaster, visit ksre.ksu.edu slash fcs and click on the link for Living Well Wednesday webinar series. If you're already registered for that series, you'll get an email reminder. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. And this is the K-State Radio Network.